Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a timeline of evidence presented in the Menendez trial today detailing a quid pro quo. The senior senator isn't buying any of it. I think we keep disproving the government's case. Plus, under fire, the most recent addition to the crowded race for governor is defending his first and largest endorsement. But, but when you get 200,000 educators who come together voluntarily, uh, who pool our resources and say, uh, you know, we want our voices to be heard. We want to have uh, a little bit of say in, in, in the outcomes that affect us. Also on this first day of summer, as temperatures rise, studies show so do the chances of gun violence and crime. And warning labels on social media sites. The U.S. Surgeon General asking Congress to help curb a growing mental health crisis among teens. The things that I worry about with kids is uh, the amount of time that kids are on social media, the scrolling nature of it, the, um, uh, the algorithm. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. Senior Senator Bob Menendez was back in court today after the court was dark for the Juneteenth holiday. Today, prosecutors laying out a meticulous timeline of events from trips the senator took to Egypt to dinners here stateside with Egyptian officials to gifts of watches and those infamous gold bars, all to try and prove their case that the senator's actions were in line with a quid pro quo and not merely business as usual for a sitting member of Congress. Menendez poking holes in the prosecutor's case as he entered court this morning. I think we keep disproving the government's case. Well, senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has been in the courtroom all day. Brenda, take us through this timeline of evidence the prosecution presented. Yeah, Raven, what they did was set up this timeline using text messages, phone messages, even web searches to convince jurors that Bob and Nadine Menendez got gold bars and lavish gifts in return for the senator's influence. And today they focused their case on co-defendant and developer Fred Davies. Now, Davies was facing a bank fraud case. And according to the prosecution, they used web searches, put that up in front of of the jury, records showing when Senator Menendez would do a search, how much is a kilo of gold worth? At that point, it was worth about $60,000. But then they would use other records to connect those web searches to, for example, phone calls from the senator and text messages from Nadine that were connected to the Davies case. And they're hoping that the jurors in their minds will connect those dots. Now, of course, Fred Davies never specifically put a request for a gold bar in a text message. But there was one situation where Nadine said, you know, I'm still looking for that glazed donut. And Davies texted right back, yes, I'm going to bring you that donut. And of course, everybody in the courtroom is wondering, gee, does a glazed donut uh, mean a gold bar, <laughs> Raven? So, Brenda, how did they connect all these dots? So this was a case of just taking photographic evidence, all right? They had seized Nadine's cell phone from the home that she shared with Bob Menendez. And on that cell phone, they found photographs of gold bars. They were able to look at the dates and connect them to times that she had met, for example, uh, with the driver for Fred Davies. You look at the gold bars, they would show the jury, here's the serial number. Then they showed a list of gold bars that were seized by the FBI when they did the raid on that home in Englewood Cliffs. And the serial numbers would match Raven. And then again, they're 
they let the jury make the connection in their mind. So how did this gold bar in this photograph end up there? Um, the defense has argued, of course, that those gold bars were not bribes, that they were nothing but gifts. Um, regardless, remember, Nadine was looking at some serious financial troubles. She was going to lose her house. Her, you know, her house was in foreclosure. She didn't have a car. And after she met Menendez, you know, after a year or so, suddenly she's shopping for houses, Raven. She's looking, for example, at a home in Englewood Cliffs that was listed for $4.7 million, six bedrooms and nine bathrooms. Wow. So, Brenda, where are they taking wow. this case now? So the government started presenting the, f the final piece of its case today, and that involves the Qatari government. Senator Menendez, they allege, curried favor with the Qatari government and with Qatari investors because Fred Davies had a very big but very expensive project that he wanted uh, to develop in Edgewater. And so uh, Menendez essentially sent positive messages, co-sponsored resolutions in favor of the Qatari government. At one point, he even attended a very posh dinner in New York City persuaded uh, Cory Booker to attend that, that with him. Uh, after the dinner, Fred Davies, for example, offered him his choice of watches, including a $29,000 Patek Philippe. We don't have any indication if he picked a watch or not. But ultimately, the Qataris invested $95 million in Davies' project. Uh, the defense attorneys argued there's no connection. Cross-examination is going to continue next week, Raven. Excellent reporting as always. Brenda Flanagan, thank you. This month marks National Gun Violence Awareness Month, and while New Jersey reported a record low number of shootings in 2023, according to state officials, public safety still remains a top priority for local leaders and survivors of gun violence. Today in Newark, community organizations and victims of gun violence gathered and pinpointed an urgent need for crime victim support and solutions to prevent violence in Newark. This event is part of Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice's Right to Heal Tour, a multi-city community event series giving various people an opportunity to share their experiences. The organization is very important because I feel like only the community can save the community. It's very important that we're out here, those of us that were former perpetrators, former victims, survivors or otherwise, to actually engage our community members to get them to put down the guns, reduce the violence and kind of like get on that journey of social responsibility. New Jersey Education Association President Sean Spiller is the latest Democratic contender to enter an already crowded field for the governor's seat. But his announcement was met with some backlash after he secured an endorsement from his union and the financial resources that come with it. Spiller, a member of the NJPBS Community Advisory Board, remained silent about the endorsement until now. Senior political correspondent David Cruz sat down with him for the first time to address the endorsement and his gubernatorial run. This is our chance to make New Jersey the place that we know it can be uh, and that it should be for us as well. That Sean Spiller, the Montclair mayor and New Jersey Education Association president, is getting the backing of the powerful union he leads is no surprise. That the backing of the union makes him a genuine contender in the race for governor shouldn't be a surprise either. It has millions and millions of dollars from union dues and associated PACs, and it's not afraid to weaponize them, as it did against the former Senate president in 2017. Steve Sweeney tries to tell you he gets things done for South Jersey. Don't believe him. You know, nobody questions when we have all these millionaires, billionaires who swoop in all the time, right? And and one or two of them exert more influence than, my God, all of us put together, right? But but when you get 200,000 educators who come together voluntarily, uh, who pool our resources and say, uh, you know, we want our voices to be heard. We want to have uh, a little bit of say in, in, in the outcomes that affect us. Uh, when we do that, you know, there's a question of, uh, of well, is, is, it, is, it, is it fair that we uh, try to get influence? Is it, uh, you know, how are we doing this? The union dropped $2 million into a nonprofit advocacy group called Protecting Our Democracy, as that featured Spiller in the months leading up to his announcement. Just a small sample of what the union can do. 
But beyond the union's influence, Spiller still has to answer questions about his tenure as mayor of Montclair, which is about to come to an end after one term and was marked by controversy and often chaos. Let's see him address that. Yeah, I am. I am going to address it. Former mayor and city councilor Bob Russo, a Spiller critic, says the mayor, who makes close to $400,000 as union president, still has to answer why he took benefits from the city to which he wasn't entitled. Shuan has, as you know, a big job, high pay, all benefits covered, and still he took the payments in lieu, which amounted to about $50,000. People are outraged at that. I'm a political science teacher for years at Montclair State and Rutgers. I give him a D minus. It's just some of the baggage that Spiller will have to carry into an already crowded Democratic primary field with two mayors, including Rasparaka of Newark and Steve Fulop of Jersey City, plus the aforementioned NJEA public enemy number one, with others set to follow. Analyst Micah Rasmussen says that's a heavy load for Spiller. Sometimes political controversies and scandals don't have a personal edge to them. This one does, not because he's necessarily enriching himself, but because there's a perception when it involves benefits or when it involves salary or compensation um, that it is, there's a perception of self-dealing. And that is one that is very difficult to get out from under. But to the extent that this information gets known by primary voters, he's going to have to have some tight answers to these questions. And my lawyer made me do it, which is Spiller's current defense, may not fly with a skeptical electorate, even in a big field where there's going to be plenty of distracting noise. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. As the scorching heat continues to melt the Garden State, this unprecedented heat wave brings another type of danger, increased violence. According to several studies, a summer surge in gun violence and crime could be directly tied to the heat. On this official first day of summer, mental health reporter Bobby Breyer took a deeper dive into communities like Patterson, which saw an uptick in crime this year over last, and joins me now to discuss his findings. All right, Bobby, thanks for joining me. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for having me. So summer is usually a time when people are out, they're enjoying outside, even when it's hot, but we also know, according to your reporting, when it's hot out, that's also a time when violence spikes as well. And so let's talk about the connection with heat and with violence. Sure, there's really two theories right now uh, that academics and researchers have pointed to between the correlation between heat and violence and just overall crime in general. One is the heat aggression theory, essentially that holds that uh, as it gets hotter outside, people tend to be more irritable, tend to be angrier, and often could lead to conflict and violence, including gun violence. In addition to that, there's a second theory that shows that in cities, especially uh, if it's extremely densely populated, you'll see people going outside of their home more often if they don't have suitable air conditioning units. Because that's the case, there's literally and figuratively more people outside that could and could then bump into each other, uh, which could then create more conflict, uh, more violence, and could potentially lead to more gun violence. Although those two theories kind of both hold water, the one that has been uh, more popular amongst researchers uh, and academics recently has been that second theory, uh, that there are more people outside due to the fact uh, that air conditioning units uh, just aren't holding up right now. Are we seeing a spike in violence? And, and, and in what areas are we talking about? Because we know that there are also a lot of things going on in different cities to kind of prevent violence as well. Sure, right now there has been um, a drop in violence, in 20, gun violence in particular, in 2023 across the state. But if you look at certain numbers coming out of places like Patterson, there has been a spike since Memorial Day in some of the gun violence shooting victims that places like the Patterson Healing Collective have responded to so far. So unfortunately, although there has been a statewide drop in recent years, there has been an uptick uh, since Memorial Day that a lot of organizations are seeing, uh, but they have certainly taken uh, preventative measures uh, to address and prevent that uh, as the summer has continued. We know a lot of events and programs and initiatives start with really the families of victims <laughs> um, who have suffered from gun violence. Right. So what are some of the challenges? What are you hearing from families? I know that through your reporting, you were able to speak to some of these families. Mm -hmm. 
Right now, you know, uh, one of the biggest challenges um, after somebody uh, passes away from gun violence is is the grief that families feel. Uh, the fact that a lot of this grief is not just in the moment that it happens, but that it really never goes away. Uh, a lot of advocates stress to me the fact that grief is an ongoing price, process that really changes throughout the course of somebody's lifetime. There have been efforts to address some of that through places like, once again, the Patterson Healing Collective, uh, the Sisterhood Squad. Essentially, that's a bereavement group for mothers uh, who have lost a child to gun violence. Uh, but in addition to that, the the biggest challenge that a lot of victims face is kind of like a lot of people move on with their lives um, if they maybe knew the person in, in some way or another, but the direct family members' lives are completely altered. And that lack of understanding or that lack of connection sometimes could really be a, a burden for direct, uh, direct victim family members. So it's a tough time um, for family members, but also for community members as well. You know, you can't always control how hot it is, but there are events and Great. programs and groups, as you mentioned, that are trying to prevent violence. Bobby Breyer, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah. The undocumented spouses of U.S. citizens now have a pathway to citizenship. President Biden unveiled a new program that would grant temporary legal status and work for a period of up to three years while their case is being handled. As Ted Goldberg reports, the new policy could impact some of the 16,000 DACA recipients here in Jersey. <music> For DACA recipients, it can be a decades-long process to become an American citizen. This is literally the only place that I've ever lived, ever, you know, come to know, if anything, because, mind you, I came here when I was three years old, so anything that I might have experienced in Uruguay, I might have forgotten. It's a frustrating process for many of us because, it, you know, it's very uncertain what the future holds. Eric Cruz Morales left Mexico for the U.S. with his family when he was eight. As a DACA recipient, he fills out forms and pays about $600 in fees every other year, a process he says is cumbersome. But under a new program from the Biden administration, it would streamline the process for some DACA recipients to become citizens. I think it's a great step in the right direction. President Joe Biden has made a few major moves on immigration recently. An executive order has created a pathway to citizenship for people married to American citizens for 10 years. These people would also stay in the U.S. while their case is being heard and would be on work visas for three years. Immigration advocates have mixed views on this, with skepticism about timing. It's very hypocritical to be able to do this. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, what the reasons were. I, I, for me, I think, you know, it's political reasons that he's doing this now when he could have been doing this at the beginning of, of, uh, of his term. I do appreciate what Biden is doing for um, for DACA recipients, there's been people that have been, you know, living in the U.S. with no sort of uh, permanent status for like the last 30, 40, or maybe even, you know, last 50 years, if anything. Um, so we're trying to see if we can get those protections put in place, um, you know, rather than later. He's doing this uh, very delicate balancing act. And the, the problem is he's not ever going to win this issue. He's just trying to lower the temperature on it. Earlier this month, President Biden put a daily cap on how many people can cross the border and claim asylum. A plurality of Americans approves of this, according to the most recent Monmouth poll. Even then, 46% of Americans think the order is not tough enough when it comes to dealing with illegal immigration. Biden's approval rating sits at 38%, which isn't his lowest mark, but it doesn't bode well for his chances at re-election. We haven't seen a president who goes into the election under 40 percent approval when Donald Trump has successfully used immigration as, uh, you know, kind of this catch all for how the country is in chaos and how we are being, uh, you know, culturally threatened. There's also the fact that executive orders can be easily overturned by whoever sits in the Oval Office. If President Trump wins, then, you know, chances of this program being revoked are very likely just from his rhetoric and from his stance on immigration. You know, this is something that I'm, he would not support. DACA recipients will be keeping a close eye on the next election as a possible path to citizenship could hang in the balance this November. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg.
In our Spotlight on Business report, Congressman Frank Pallone and others were in Bradley Beach today to announce new grant funding through the Beach Act to improve water quality and protect the health of beachgoers. Under the Beach Act, $250,000 in grant money will be used to test the ocean waters for illness causing bacteria, pollution, and to notify the public of the water's condition and quality. The EPA, since 2001, has given nearly $230 million in Beach Act grants to test beach waters across the United States. The state's DP commissioner, Sean LaTourette, says as a result, visitors can enjoy carefree days at the beach. We take these funds together with, with other state money, and every single week, multiple times, we get up in the air to evaluate our coastline and our water quality. We remotely sense using technology the quality of our waters to ensure that we understand where pollution may exist and could be coming from. Turning to Wall Street, stocks slipped slightly today after hitting a record high. Here's how the markets close for the day. The U.S. Surgeon General has called on Congress to require warning labels on social media platforms detailing the effects on young people's lives. The warnings would be similar to those now mandatory on cigarette boxes. The announcement comes after the Surgeon General voiced major concerns that social media is associated with a growing mental health crisis among teenagers in an opinion piece in the New York Times. But is this feasible and is it enough to improve children and teens' mental health? To discuss more on the topic, I'm joined by Chief of Adolescent Medicine at St. Joseph's University Medical Center in Patterson, Dr. Jennifer Chuang. Dr. Chuang, thanks for being with us. Sure, of course. Thank you for having me here. You know, the U.S. Surgeon General in a recent op-ed said that social media is associated with significant mental health harms for adolescents. Do you agree with this assessment? Yes, we've definitely been concerned about social media impact on children and teenagers for quite some time. And certainly the Surgeon General has been uh, bringing this as a concern for uh, the last couple of years, but certainly um, bringing it uh, much to the hallmark of our concern for um, over the last year, including this week. You know, in your work, what have you seen in terms of the impact of social media on adolescents? Well, I think right now the reality is after social media has been around for probably two decades now, we know it's not going away. So we do know it's a part of our lives, but we do need to be more cognizant about how it's affecting our lives, um, all of us, adults as well as children. Uh, the things that I worry about with kids is uh, the amount of time that kids are on social media, the scrolling nature of it, the um, uh, the algorithm uh, that uh, that brings people in. Um, and at this age, we really do worry about brains developing. And we do see that for kids who are on social media for a prolonged period of time, um, uh, like reports say over three hours, uh, that those kids really do report more loneliness, um, symptoms of depression and anxiety. Uh, I definitely see in my practice lots of concerns about body image issues. Um, and uh, concerns about disordered eating behaviors as well. You know, like warning labels we see on cigarette packages, he is asking Congress to require a Surgeon General's warning label on all social media platforms. Is this idea feasible? Well, I think if it's been feasible for tobacco and alcohol products, then I think it's feasible for uh, social media as well. Uh, I think it, it takes all of us to be uh, engaged in uh, how to protect our kids, um, uh, how to protect ourselves as well. Listen, I have two little girls. As a parent, some of this content on these platforms is really frightening. I mean that. Um, we know that getting a warning label like this could take time. So mm -hmm. what should I be doing, other parents be doing in the meantime? I think we should all be aware about what our kids are accessing on these sites. Uh, certainly, 
Uh, it would be nice if we could all <laughs> oversee the types of sites that our kids are on, but I know that it's hard to be hovering 24 seven. Uh, so I do think it's really important for us to educate our kids about why we're concerned. Uh, tell them about the addictive nature about a lot of, a lot of these social media platforms. Uh, why are these sites sucking our kids um, in? And why is it hard to come off of the platforms? And to uh, really discuss with them, what do they see amongst their peers? Is it really helping them? Um, uh, they might initially get on the platform to connect with their peers, but are they seeing uh, more negative effects? Again, like the signs of loneliness, depression. I think as we uh, talk about the, the concerns about social media, um, this is another reason to talk about those topics. Absolutely. Dr. Chuang, thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Again, thank you for having me. That does it for us tonight. Before you go, a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Raven Santana for the entire team here at NJ Spotlight News. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Life is unpredictable. Health insurance shouldn't be. For over 90 years, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey has provided quality, affordable health plans to New Jersey residents. We have served generations of New Jersey families and businesses and are committed to driving innovations that put you at the heart of everything we do. Our members are our neighbors, our friends, and our families. We're here when you need us most. Horizon, proud to be New Jersey.